Beneath the complex, a water channel tunneled from a nearby aqueduct diverted five million gallons of fresh water into the baths every day. Water for the hot pools was diverted to furnaces where it was heated over wood fires. As many as 50 such furnaces were built directly beneath the floor. This floor literally divided the world of the wealthy and successful Roman citizen from the underworld of slaves and laborers who were toiling away in furnace-like conditions, stoking fires and, and choked with smoke and fumes and, and so on. Up here in these beautifully decorated chambers with marbles and mosaics and uh, decorated tiled ceilings, it must have seemed like paradise. The baths of Caracalla opened in 216 AD. They were one of the last great feats of Roman engineering, combining all the skills the Romans had perfected over the centuries. In a bath complex like that of Caracalla, a lot of great achievements of Roman engineering come together. The production of bricks, masonry, the import of marble. You have the long tradition that the Romans have in building water systems, aqueducts, but also drainage and sewer systems. You have also their long experience in the use of concrete, which allows them to create big spaces that they can cover with vast spanning domes and vaults. Caracalla's baths were an amazing success but the same couldn't be said for his reign. While his pet project strained the Roman economy, Caracalla hemorrhaged more cash on costly invasions of Parthia and Armenia, eastern regions not controlled by a Roman emperor since Trajan a century earlier. Like Trajan, Caracalla had hoped to cement his legacy through conquest. Instead, he sealed his own fate. In 217 AD, after a six-year reign of cruelty and intimidation, Caracalla was stabbed to death by his own guards during an Eastern military campaign. That same year, a devastating fire gutted the Colosseum and the soul of the capital. The amphitheater would be rebuilt 20 years later, but the empire itself would never recover. The glory days of Augustus, Vespasian, and Trajan were long gone, and they would never return. Over the next three centuries, the empire that had once burned so brightly slowly burned out. The theories as to why fill volumes. Some people say it is the metallurgy that poisoned them. Some people say it is the decadence and the inbreeding in the upper class. Some people say it is the lack of a trained army and subsequently no defense. I think the Roman Empire was simply too large to be governed effectively, to be administered, and to create any kind of real sense of community. In the 5th and 6th centuries, Germanic warrior tribes repeatedly sacked Rome, demanding land and money. In 537, an invading tribe went right for the jugular, destroying the city's most vital life-sustaining arteries, its aqueducts. Without the running water its citizens had come to rely on, the once great capital crumbled. People without water couldn't live in the city center. The gardens and farmlands could not be watered. The population of 1.2 million people quickly dwindled to 12,000. That's a 99% decrease. 1,500 years after the fall of Rome, its engineering legacy still inspires and confounds modern builders. So many of the things that the Romans uh, were able to do in their time, we were not able to do again until we developed new technologies. We wouldn't be able to accomplish a dome like the Pantheon without the use of a computer, certainly. We wouldn't be able to move a hillside without mechanized equipment. Given their tools, we would never be able to accomplish those same things. 
Maybe the most important lesson the Romans taught us is one that Julius Caesar, Nero, and Caracalla never understood. That the same blind ambition that drives our progress can also bring about our demise. These people lived out their ambitions and their kind of appetites in such a way that we both admire them and kind of abhor them at the same time. The ancient Romans were often violent, vindictive, greedy, and egocentric. But the imposing structures they left behind stand as evidence not only of the power of one civilization, but of the unlimited potential of humankind.